Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a very nice lunch break in the sun and feel eager to continue with the program, although it has already be, been three long, intense days. So, we will now continue with the fifth workshop uh, titled The Sea, a Living Lab. In this uh, explorative and experimental workshop, we will have uh, Nina Tynkkynen, Magnus Hellström, Taru Elfing, Henrik Ringbrum, and Jannika Haldin participating. And Anna Törnroos Remes will act as a moderator. Please, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, um, also participating from uh, via Zoom or stream. With every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea, no matter where you are on Earth. This is uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, her deepness, as she's been called by New York Times, um, or the hero for the planet by Time magazine, a renowned marine biologist and pioneer of deep sea exploration and conservation. I wanted to start with this quote because I think it gives us a good basis for our discussion here today. We're going to discuss and, and talk about um, our relationship to nature, to the sea, um, and how we use it, uh, how we conserve it, um, and how we go forward in these changing times. My name is Anna uh, Dörros Remes, and I'm a marine biologist working as an assistant professor. Um, here at Obo Academy and within the research profile, the sea. Mm, my research interest is the seafloor, what kind of creatures that live there, what they do, um, that is the functions they perform and how these functions then in turn uh, links to the functioning of the sea and oceans and what we as humans can, can get out of, of the sea and how we can use it. And that is uh, some of the core aspect that we're also going to discuss here today. With me today um, in this workshop and living lab is also Nina Tynkkinen, an associate professor in public administration. You can say hi. hi. <laughs> Magnus Hellström, an associate professor in industrial management. Taru Elving, a curator, writer based in Helsinki. Um, Henrik Ringbom. Um, head of Research of Law Sciences at Obo Academy University and part-time professor also at the Scandinavian Institute uh, of Maritime Law. And also uh, Jannika Haldin, a marine biologist uh, working as a professional, professional secretary at HELCOM, uh, the Baltic Marine Protection Commission. And you will hear more about their experiences and interests um, uh, in a short while, but first I want to briefly open up what the living lab um, is and some concepts that we're going to discuss here today. A living lab is essentially a, a concept that is often defined as user-centered, uh, open innovation ecosystems that integrates uh, concurrent research and innovation processes within a public-private people partnership, the four Ps. The concept of a living laboratory uh, is cre was created by William J. Mitchell and Kent Larson and Alex Pentland at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who first explored it. Um, Leminen in, in 2015 discussed the concept and, and definition of a living lab in its current form and describes it as a physical region uh, of virtual realities or interaction spaces in which stakeholders from different uh, public-private partnerships, uh, companies, public agencies, universities, users, um, and other types of stakeholders um, collaborate, create, prototype or validate, and test new technologies, um, concepts, services, products, systems in real-life context. Um, a living lab also involves four main activities uh, that we're going to explore here today. Co-creation is the first one. Um, exploration, discovering and emerging usages, behaviors, ideas. Um, 
Experimentation is the third one, implementing sort of live scenarios um, and ideas of, of how this would be in, in real life. And then the fourth and, and final one, evaluation. That is the assessment of these concept products, um, socio, um, cognitive and socio-economic criteria, socio, social, ecological ones, and so forth. Uh, and these are actually the four steps that we're gonna we're gonna do here today as well and engage in. Um, it is said that the benefits uh, from this type of working living lab offers the, the, the ones that are participating um, solutions to, to real world or examples of solutions to real world problems um, that might otherwise have been unsolvable and cost uh, efficient access and data and experiences is difficult to get without them. And these real world problems are essentially when it comes to the water um, are, very, or are they very essential and, and, and especially complicated when it comes to the water. Uh, and, and we quite often call them wicked problems. And wicked problems are, are challenging and urgent uh, societal problems with numerous causes and effects. Um, and the term wicked problem was first discussed by Churchman in 1967. Um, and later defined and formalized uh, regarding social and natural uh, sciences by Riedel and uh, Weber in 1973. Um, and it, when regard to the sea, Basken and Bunsdorf has, has discussed these wicked problems as changes in the ocean engine, for example, is one wicked problem. Um, wicked problems such as the circulation and overturning um, of the seas linked very much to climate change as we see as a, as a wicked problem, sea level rise, uh, plastic pollution, for example, and so on. Um, so these are the two concepts and frameworks, um, uh, if you like, the living lab and wicked problems that are gonna be center pillars here today and also center, center pillars within our, our research profile, which is called the C uh, here at Obo Academy. We shall uh, just turn to this uh, maritime legal landscape here and properly start our living lab. But I briefly wanted to introduce you to the concepts also of ecosystem services and nature's contribution to, to people. Uh, these are sort of boils down to the suggested linkages between biological diversity, the, the species, the plants, the animals, and what they do in the system, their functions, and these functions then being able to provide us with, with different kind of services. And, and this is then linked to our human well-being. And this was first discussed or came forward as a, as a large uh, policy and uh, on a sort of social arena um, through the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, that was called for by uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2000. From this um, came out the idea of these ecosystem services, as I said, on a, on a larger general um, platform gen to a general audience. And um, in this, um, the concept of biodiversity ecosystem services um, um, was divided uh, into different categories. These services and goods that nature provides us can be divided into provisioning services, such as food or fresh water, um, various materials, supporting services such as uh, cycling of nutrients or elements, um, the primary production uh, of RCs, for example, regulating services, uh, climate regulation, water purification, and so on. And the fourth one, cultural services. That includes um, aesthetic, spiritual, education uh, activities and various uh, of these kinds, which we have very much discussed throughout Abagora here. Um, these in terms, as I said, can be linked to the human well-being, which can en encompasses um, personal sort of security, personal safety, access to basic resources, um, basic material for good uh, for a good life, shelter, livelihood, health. Um, good social relationship and freedom and choice of life. Through this, um, the, the process um, formed uh, and was to be taken up by something that's called the Economics and Eco of Ecosystems and Biodiversity TEB, um, that sort of turned it more into a, a tool for policymakers, a tool for bringing it into the business uh, sector by looking at also valuing these 
uh, these services. And that is, of course, a, a difficult uh, subject of how do you value nature. Um, and these have resulted in, in, in a, a common international classification of these ecosystem services and also um, taken forward by the in Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, um, which are now trying to bring in these, especially these cultural, what we call services, um, and, and the complexities with these, and, and look at it more from a holistic uh, point of view. Uh, and more inclusive also to indigenous um, um, groups um, uh, of people and, um, and, and so forth. So, um, these ecosystem services is what we're gonna, gonna start discussing here now. Um, um, and we, we're gonna start with the co-creation of this living lab. And I will now also bring a little bit of co-creation to our group here. Um, So, I was thinking we can start with um, sort of co-creating a little bit and discussing what we're seeing here, uh, what, what you have in front of you. you. You have looked at it a little bit already. Um, so, Janika, um, what does this legal landscape represent, represent to you and, 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 and the way you, you, you look at the sea and, and, and the relationship you have with the sea? And, and can you tell us also a little bit more about what you do in your work? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I think in many ways this represents both my, my personal view of the sea and what I do for a living. Um, where I work, it's a, a convention to protect the environment of the Baltic specific. Uh, and what we are doing there is working together with all of the countries around the Baltic to try to ensure that the environment has enough space <laughs> uh, to ensure resilience in, in light of future changes, for example, climate change, but also to tackle some of our sins from the past, which is essentially what we have already um, caused in the sea and what we have put into it, but that we can't take out now. And this table here it represents it quite well in the sense that the Baltic is quite a small sea, it has a, a very large catchment area of uh, almost 85 million residents living in this catchment area. And uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so what we have here is like, you can see intense use of the sea. Uh, there are lots of human activities going on. You have shipping, you have leisure cruises, you have infrastructure, for example, wind farms, you have food production in the form of fishing or, or uh, aquaculture, and a lot of leisure use, uh, which is a huge part of, of the Baltic. So uh, for me, this represents the reality for the Baltic as a whole, where everyone wants a piece and there's not always enough pieces to go around, uh, much like this Lego table. <laughs> so in that sense, I think um, it's a useful tool to show what we are facing. Yeah, so please, you can, you can also, if you, if you like to grab things, if you like to check into things a little bit more, then, then uh, just do that. But Nina, uh, thank you, Janika, for that. Um, you work with, with uh, governing this, this sea um, and, and qu questions and topics we link to that. What particularly falls into uh, your eyes or, or did, that you spot here for this table? Um, well, I see a lot of uh, actors, a lot of actions uh, going on around the sea, uh, on the coast, but also under water. Um, and that is exactly, I think, the, the point in, in my research or in our research in governance, um, that to get an, some sort of an overview of how this entire puzzle can be managed uh, and governed, and it's not an easy task. We see very conflicting needs and interests, and somehow we need to uh, f fix the situation so that they all fit here. Or maybe harmful activities don't fit, but, but so far everything that is legal 
is, oh, except for that pirate, pirate there, but. <laughs> Uh, so, but that's also part of the picture. There are, I there are also illegal activities going on. Um, but that's like my Im uh, immediate uh, reaction when I look at this. And also that it's an imaginary uh, landscape, uh, which maybe illustrates how we imagine and what kind of sizes of activities we see. But I'm puzzled because yesterday we were already co-creating this and I thought that this ferry over there, that it's a cruise, this kind of luxury cruise, but now I was told that no, it's a... Um, risk. Yeah, so... Um, and because I, I thought it's good that it's so big if it's illustrating our luxury ideas and touristic activities here, but obviously not. But I will imagine or play so that it, it's, a, it's a cruise ship for me. Interesting, yeah, and interesting with these conflicting, conflicting views that we will talk a little bit more about as well. And, 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 and this language aspect here, I mean, that, that, that thing, things can seem to be something for one person and, and something for the other. Um, Taro, can you say something more about your background and, and topics of work that relate to this and, and, and how you uh, see this table? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my background is in art, contemporary art and art history. So I'm the kind of a weird one here maybe around the table. Um, but I've worked for over 10 years now with artists looking at environmental questions, particularly in the um, archipelago sea area. Um, and, um, and we've been with artists working a lot with scientists as well, uh, but also other stakeholders. Um, working with local communities in different ways and, and, and so really uh, in between different disciplines and, and different modes of knowledge. Um, and also our focus on, on the sea has been very much uh, through looking at how the environmental questions are always entangled with uh, other social, economic, historical and so on questions. So this is a kind of, in a way, represents that I think quite well. Um, but uh, um, I, I think from coming from the arts and the kind of questions that artists are now looking at and engaging with, um, there's one thing that I was thinking first of all was where's the perspective of the um, other animals than humans. Um, a lot of artists are working with um, uh, the kind of thinking about the perception of uh, the other species. How do we, how can we imagine um, and, and develop empathy through to different ways of, of trying to imagine the kind of being in the world um, as another living organism, whether it's a plant or an animal, um, and the kind of modes of questions around communication between species, but also um, the different modes of uh, sensing the changes in the environment uh, with climate change, for example. Um, another thing that I was thinking of that is very difficult to represent with the Lego um, is the uh, um, scales, the different scales. So when uh, the kind of the larger uh, scale of, of a kind of a bird's eye view, for example, that we kind of have here, but not planetary enough, uh, maybe. Uh, but the microscopic, how do you go actually under the surface? And how do you, or how do you look at things on that level that is actually not visible for us with human eyes without some sort of technological uh, medium? Um, so that's maybe one thing. And, and also the kind of diversity of of cultural contexts. Um, I think somehow it's very difficult maybe with this to uh, represent the complexity of what's at stake globally uh, with the sea. Um, if we think of climate change, um, I don't see any eroding coastline uh, or the kind of uh, collapsing communities, fishing communities, due to climate change, but also global industry, for example. Uh, so the kind of, um, maybe these kinds of quite dramatic effects that climate change, but also global um, economies having in different coastal communities around the world and, and ecosystems. We don't really maybe see them here locally yet, uh, but they're kind of there globally and they have an impact also, and we have an impact on those. So that's a kind of difficult, but I also have to say that I love the fact that it's the rescue 
boat that is really massive. It's like the scale of a cruise ship, because maybe that's a kind of, that's a temporal, that's a kind of reflection of the kind of, um, hopefully not utopian future, where we actually, the biggest ships around the globe are actually the rescue ships rather than the cruise ships. So. The urgency um, that we have now to 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 rescue this planet and and, and what we live from. Yeah, thanks, Taro. Um, yeah, uh, in, this is very. I I myself think that this represents quite not good the way we from the science and business and uh, or natural science world maybe are discussing this aspect now, and I think it's extremely important to bring in those cultural, and, and also these cultural collapses that you're talking about, um, because they're not necessarily either seen in, in these um, intergovernmental panel assessments that comes out, for example. But, but speaking of technology also here, Magnus, that's your field maybe a little bit. Um, what's your, what, what interests you with this, this landscape here, and can you um, tell us a little bit what, what you work with uh, here on the, or what's closest to your research focus here? Yes, um, obviously I, I represent the, the gray side, the, the kind of dull side here. Uh, but uh, I, I believe we, we all sort of got a crash course uh, last spring uh, into what modern supply chains, modern logistics actually, how they work. We, we all of a sudden, you know, were in a situation where, where this sort of chain didn't work. Uh, we had hiccups and, and uh, one, one consequence were, was, for example, that a lot of uh, the, the built uh, infrastructure, boats, ships, they were standing still, uh, causing, you know, um, economical damage to, 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 to the ones who try to keep up the system. But I, I think it's also made us aware of, of, of that we, we are badly needing this system. We, it might not work perfectly, but, but we, we really, we are so dependent on it. And, and this is something that sort of intrigues me, that how, how can we improve? Because the, the modern way of thinking is also that it's, it's not just a ship that goes back and forth between Shanghai and Rotterdam. It's, it's actually a chain that goes forward. It, it, it goes on with a smaller ship to, to the Baltic. Uh, something is loaded on a train, goes up to the northern Finland, and, and so on. Um, and and there, isn't, there are so many different stages and actors, and, and it, it, um, every time, you know, the ownership of the freight, for example, sort of changes uh, uh, mean or mode, uh, we have a, a sort of an opportunity for, for an inefficiency to occur. So, so there is so much we can do with, with sort of organizing this in a better way. And, and when I say that, I, I, I really mean also that organizing in a way that, that makes it more acceptable to us as, as uh, citizens, that it, it should be sustainable, uh, it, it should be sort of more, in a way, humanized. Uh, and that's uh, sort of also, you know, I, I'd rather be on this side in, in many ways, um, sitting, being the lady sitting in, sitting in the jacuzzi here, but, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I feel, you know, th there is where, where my, why I, where I have a lot of work to do and, and Sort of, tr but trying to understand and, and, and make it sort of one with the green side here. Thanks. Um, Hendrik, I know you enjoy sailing a lot, and I realize that the winds haven't uh, presented us with a sailboat. Uh, we have a lot of other boats here, though, um, and a surfer. So, um, can you tell us a little bit more um, what you do and, and what you relate uh, to here? Does it work? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, in a way, this captures most of my research interests um, because I, I, I deal with, with maritime law and, 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 and law of the sea, and it's very much about dealing with these conflicting interests and conflicting concerns that, that humans and, and others have in, in, in shared areas. But uh, two things maybe in particular, uh, deserve mentioning one, one particular focus that I've uh, been working with has to do with, with uh, governance. How, how, how do we legislate maritime activities? How we, we have a ugly little building over there. It's supposed to represent the, the authorities, the, 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 uh, 
the civil servants and politicians and others who, who actually govern all this. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm quite interested in how, how this is done, because in the Baltic Sea it's, it's very special. It's almost like a laboratory of, of, of different layers of rules acting together and, and sometimes conflicting and sometimes going in different directions and sometimes working very, very well together. Um, so, so that is one thing and that in a way covers, covers all of this. The other thing that I'm being particularly keen on uh, is, is ships, this, this type of ships and, and how to make them as, as clean and safe and green as, as possible so that they eventually are as safe as sailing ships. Good. Um, I think, yeah, we can explore a little bit. You can, you can lift that up maybe, uh, Henrik. And, and um, Janneke, I'm thinking um, if we take a deep a dive in here, into this um, table here, I mean, we see that's supposed to represent the, the sea floor, and you come down there, and there's a, a, and a, the things that we rarely see, the nature, really. Um, we see uh, maybe on the, on the surface, what we encounter often and what we discuss right now is, is very much the algae um, and those parts. Uh, but then we also have different species on land and the, especially uh, the diversity of species and the diversity of, of um, functions that we have that support us from, from underneath. You, you work with the Helsinki Commission and, and how, uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How do you guys tie these things together, and especially focusing on the, the nature uh, as such and, and the safeguarding of that. Thank you. Uh, so if, if um, we've had some takers on this side here, on the gray side, and we've had some takers on that side over there and, and different activities, then essentially what we do is what's in the middle. So we, ha we, we work directly with the sea and the consequences of our, what that our actions have on the sea and the seafloor, um, where, as you say, the seafloor is often a little bit harder to illustrate because people don't have a direct relation to it. But uh, with my little co-creation species piece here, um, it's a, a small little pond with a, a turtle in it. And this is quite illustrative for me of how much space nature uh, and the environment takes in a lot of the discussions that we have about how we use the sea and, and what, how the sea serves us. Because as you mentioned in the early part here about ecosystem services, that's a fairly new concept when you take it on board on the larger scale, when you take it on board in planning and, and looking at what, what part of the sea really is producing these services and what they mean for us as a society. So my little co-creation piece here really illustrates like how little space we give to nature in these discussions. Whereas if you see the board, um, nature is the central part, the sea is the central part, and a large part of that is the seafloor that we know very little about. Uh, so at Helcom, um, we are trying to take a more holistic perspective to all of this. So not looking only at one part of this, uh, but instead looking at the chain of process of what this all represents. So we have a human activity, it could be anything. Um, let's take the ship, which is closest. So transport or maritime transport, the transportation of goods which society needs. Um, but everything we do, including transport as here, uh, it has an effect on the environment and we don't always know what that effect is. But this effect in turn causes consequences for other parts of the environment. So for example, the species that live in the sea or that rely on the sea. And this is what we call pressures. So our human activities are causing pressures on the environment. And the more activity we have, the more pressures we mostly produce. And what we are trying to do is link these together to better understand how all of these activities actually uh, translate into pressures and what the consequences of those, those pressures are for the environment. Um, and that, that's not necessarily a very easy task, <laughs> but we have gotten a lot better at that uh, in the last, say, 20 years compared to what we, had, uh, we were before. And part of that is related to the understanding that we have of what we have in the sea. 
the species, the seafloor, all of it. If you don't know what's down there, you have no idea how you are, how you're affecting it. So this is what we're trying to do, getting like creating this holistic picture of the process of how we both rely on the sea, but how we also affect it. Um, and then slowly, but certainly, hopefully giving a little bit more space and a little bit more pieces <laughs> to the environmental aspect of this. Um, yeah, we can, we can maybe continue on the, the governance aspect there. Um, Nina, uh, you, you work a lot with this, but I was thinking about the, the environmental effects of, of use uh, and, and use of these services especially, but also them being services in a way, farming, fishing, and the linkages to, for example, the problems that we have here in, in the Baltic Sea eutrophication. Can you say a little bit more about these? Yes, mm, but first I have a local fisher here. We uh, already have one. And here this is maybe an example of good governance because um, there has been some maritime spatial planning here. Um, there is an industrial type uh, fishery, this fishing plant there, but local fishing, this kind of coastal fishing, it takes place here. So it wasn't placed right beside the local fisher. Um, and that is, that is one aspect of what, what I work and what we study, uh, exactly how these kind of all activities on land could be planned so, and practiced so that they don't harm each other uh, and not that much also. Uh, the environment or the marine ecosystem. Um, it is, of course, in the ideal case, there wouldn't be any uh, agriculture, for example, near the water, so that we would avoid pollution and eutrophication. But that's that's not that's not it, because we, of course, it's also for the for the humans. Uh, so one part of the work is to think and study how how these all activities can be can be organized in a way that they cause less harm uh, of interest against the activities or services or whatever we call them and and of course then the conflict uh, put upon by this the the changes that we see eutrophication climate change and so on yeah. as hendrik was saying that one way is to of course regulate but there are other type of policy measures that can be also introduced so as to, to govern the whole picture and also so that everyone's needs, everyone's voice could be heard. Um, knowledge then then sort of the physical thing we can measure um, here, which is, is much linked to um, the natural science aspect, but also um, business and, and valuation and economy in that sense. But to include, you've been working a little bit with including other types of, of knowledge um, uh, from, from different kinds of people in society. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and where, gives us some example of what, what you mean by that and where it's applied? Yeah, there are two aspects in that. First, it is quite essential to listen to, for example, farmers and what kind of conditions they have in their life and livelihoods and how they could be, for example, compensated if new regulations are set on them. That's one, one part. But then there is also knowledge like, uh, for example, the fisher, fisherman could have this kind of, uh, on, on changes in the environment and what is happening, this kind of citizen science or citizen observations that could be very useful. And if we gather also this type of knowledge, small scale observations, it can complement what, uh, what scientists do and also give us this kind of uh, quite valuable uh, information and knowledge about the values, if you were talking about the values. Um, and appreciations of people and how they maybe prioritize different choices in their everyday life and how it could be made that way that, that, that the environment was a higher priority maybe for them. But it's not like we cannot regulate it 
top down, but we need to listen to, to and appreciate also different different voices. Yeah, exactly. We can come down to the to the regulation in in, in the next phase a little bit. But I I, I can tell you on to, especially this um, the knowledge of of this other type of knowledge that we obviously seem to, to have a huge gap here. And, and, and Taro mentioned that a little bit, and I thought um, you could say something maybe on, on, on this framework of services and, and what you reflect upon on that, sort of the use of the sea. Uh, it's very natural science, as I said, economy and business driven. Um, but uh, what are here missing and how do you think that this framework could be then improved with these other aspects. I guess coming from the arts and humanities, the whole notion of ecosystem service is really problematic. Um, it's very one way. It's the idea that the ecosystem kind of uh, provides services to us. Um, so that sort of setup is, is, is seen, is quite sort of hierarchical in a way and, and human-centered. Um, but so to challenge that, uh, you know, we need different kinds of models, of course, thinking. How do we understand, how do we approach the the environment and think of our environment in different terms, you know, as, as humans as part of it, um, or pushing the kind of um, the economic logic maybe further asking, so what do we, if we gain these services from um, other um, species and, and from our environments, what do we pay back? How much do we need to pay back? You know, that actually what is the, you know, and, and, and what is that, what does that mean in non-financial terms of how do we care? How do we give, you know, what, what is it that we need to give back? Um, and that connects, I guess, to the idea, the thinking around how we are part of these ecosystems, you know, how we are actually part of these, literally the kind of watery flows, you know, we are water bodies, you know, our everyday activities are part of the flows of, of the kind of planetary waters and, 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 and how, um, how are our uh, ways of life now structured so that we're actually taking a lot of nutrients out of the flow and then pumping too much of it in through the kind of artificial fertilizer process and so on. So there's a kind of complex understanding of that, how on a very kind of bodily uh, singular from that level to actually the planetary flows, there are complex entanglements. And so how do we address that? And, uh, um, and this sort of, for example, thinking about the, if we think about the sea, the waters, uh, the seawater as a, as a community rather than as an environment or as a kind of ecosystem, what does that mean that we are part of that community? What does that then mean, you know, in terms of our our role in that community and our responsibility, and and the kind of care that is needed both ways somehow, in that? Yeah, very true. And I, I think it's um, I think arts and, and and cultural aspects, cultural ways of doing activities can really help also in in lighten us on these things. Um, I, I think I appreciate that very much. Um, but then. Um, Mm, I was thinking, Magnus and Henrik, you you work with, as you said, the maritime transport, and what what trends do you see, and maybe in relation also to this other type of knowledge use and the type of understanding, or is it just um, a lot, a, a big train or a, a huge boat that just moves forward, and 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 do these businesses listen as well, or how are they in, involved in in these aspects? Mm. Uh, well, well, I, I could um, maybe try to, to take one, one perspective uh, and, and try to, to approach your, your question uh, through that. And, and, and so, so one thing is, I think uh, when we, we think about, for example, shipping and its, its impact on, on the sea, so I think it, 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 we, we need to understand the whole system and chain. Uh, it, it, for example, it doesn't make chen, uh, sense that, that the, the ship rushes to the port and, and waits for a truck to come and, and fetch. Uh, but we can be much more sort of, uh, we can become much better in, in communicating and, and, and sort of coordinating this. So, so it's, it's sort of having this uh, uh, whole picture, which modern technology actually already quite a lot enables us. Uh, and that brings me to, to another point, which, which actually has to do again with what, what technology would, would enable uh, in terms of, of uh, engaging uh, this part here in, 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 in understanding the, the, the industrial. So uh, we, we might, uh, I, I think technology, ideally, it, it would give us much more transparency in, in how this chain works so that, that we as purchasers uh, can make better and more informed decisions about 
do we want our uh, item to, to come uh, over the seas, which sort of would, would reduce emissions? Do we want it to, to be sourced in China or, or closer to us or, or whatever? What are, the, what are the values sort of that we, we appreciate apart from strictly speaking about cost and price? to say but we can take maybe Hendrik here in, be in between yes um, yeah I wouldn't like to speak right now about ships too much because I, I would like to to, to 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 relate to some of the things that was said earlier because I, I found that very very interesting um, taking departure from what you said about this holistic way of approaching the whole I think this is a problem for, for, for lawyers and regulators um, because we are used to regulating is incredibly compartmentalized. Shipping has one set of rules which has nothing to do with the rules on, on, on wind farms and nothing to do with, with uh, the rules of, of cable layers or, or whatever you see here have their own segments and some have no segments at all. Um, but in, in addition to those sector segments we have completely artificial boundaries. So for instance, if you look at that wreck over there at the seabed, all questions relating to who is entitled to go there, who is entitled to, 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 to the uh, property there, it, it all depends on where exactly that. And that is how the sea law is, is created in a way by these artificial zones, which doesn't make sense because of course fish don't care about them and pollution don't care about them and 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 therefore uh, we are now this change towards more holistic regulation which has taken place in in, in 15 or so years is, is very interesting but it raises completely different types of problems because now uh, regulations that take departure in, in in the wealth of ecosystems tend to be very unprecise then again and then then it's a different type of problem, who, who, who is supposed to do what. And to relate a little bit to what you said about the balance between nature and, and, and humans, I think if you regulate obligations in terms of ecological ambitions and goals, you should also then provide some rights for the environment to, to, to defend itself if, if those are not met. And that is, that is in a way happening, thanks mostly to the climate change uh, litigations efforts and, and, and that is another very interesting development taking place in in in, in law good 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 thanks um, and, and as a li real living lab here now I, th I think it's time to, to to bring in the audience if there's questions or comments regarding this aspect we, we continue then with the discussion anyone here in the audience here no oh yeah or I can come there. Kuka oli? Um, oh, funny, but uh, what I was especially nice with that it was mentioned that we also are part of nature and and we flow with the water the water flows through us and we drink the water so basically what we put in the water will eventually also th flow through our body and also I'm thinking that basically I'm not an expert but I feel like in a way with the Baltic Sea we have kind of like already mostly destroyed it. But uh, now the question is, how can we serve ourselves that it's not going to be so polluted that we can manage it maybe? I'm not sure if it can recover even like, but what was the point? Yeah, wh also what I really liked was that in a, with technology, I don't uh, trust technology so much anymore that I would think that it would save the situation because in we need to we need to change our values because we are consuming too much 
and because we are part of the planet and we are also animals, so it's not like um, we are not um, separate from nature. So, um, so it's like if we want to save ourselves. And uh, but yeah, with the technology, we can like make it more a little more efficient that not so many planes and not so many boats have to be going everywhere all the time. And maybe like the regulations, because like I'm thinking this is, has nothing to do with water, but when I was living in California and there was this, what are the taxi, Uber and these things, and what was like, because in Finland there's the taxi law or something that only the taxi drivers can drive the taxis, but with that Uber thing, what is pr like uh, an issue is like probably the drivers don't get get paid well enough, but in that you can uh, share drives more, that more people can like get into the same car, that not everyone has to drive their own car. So I'm thinking maybe my question is like, how can we? like be more sensible and how can we like use uh, the regulations and also work together better and what what is the like one key thing uh, that could like make the Baltic Sea region more healthy? Much. It's it's really good questions, and I think uh, we we can uh, t tie into the especially the bioengineering aspect a little bit um, of of how much we can use technology to do things uh, in in just a while, and also um, if if um, maybe Magnus and or we would like to answer a little bit to the Uber question because you've been working a little bit with that actually. Uh, I think it was a brilliant comment, uh, actually. Uh, in a way, what, what Uber does is, is that it, it, through technology, it, it enables us to share rides and, and use the capacity of cars that we have available instead of buying new taxis. Actually, the same could go for, for ships. We, according to, to some studies of, of my colleagues, that we would need uh, only a fraction of the ships we have available today in the Baltic Sea to, to do the same service if it would be coordinated. It's extremely difficult and complex, but it, it, it would be doable. Uh, but, but this requires then again, you know, uh, a lot of new thinking, both uh, from companies and, and regulars' point of view, and, and it's, it's uh, nothing but easy. But, but I, I think it's a brilliant comment, and, and I think this sometimes in, in the whole discussion about climate change, we, we forget that, well, that's one thing that is pressing and that, that we remember, but, but we can't change the world by, by only just building new things all the time. We, we need to make much more clever use of, of the things we already have, learn to how to recycle it, learn to how to use the capacity better and, and, and much more. Thanks. Um, we, can, we can maybe, is there any more questions, uh, comments are still? No, okay. We, we, we have time for it also in, in the end, we can, we can go deeper into the discussion, but I thought we can, we can um, now we've sort of co-created a little bit, uh, explored, and now we, I thought we could experiment a little bit with scenarios of, of environmental change and so, societal change. Um, um, and I'm thinking a question to you all here, picking up a little bit on that aspect of, of um, also bioengineering and, and how much technology we can used to save the, the sea in a, in a way. Um, Jannika and Nina and, and Henrik, you probably work very much with business as, as usual, as, 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 as a starting point for, for um, these changes. But may, maybe Jannika, you can open up first a little bit what, what this business as usual is and what kind of other scenarios and, and how you work with these scenarios where you have a lot of environmental changes and also the societal changes, which can come quite quickly, like a shift in, in, in a big transportation system or, or otherwise in society. Yeah, thank you. So this, this ties into quite a lot of the comments both here in, uh, in our panel, but also uh, the question that we just had from the audience uh, about how we t tie it all together. Uh, there's something called uh, the ecosystem approach, which uh, is essentially how 
um, many also of the governing structures nowadays require that we should govern the sea. And it includes this idea that we as humans are part of the ecosystem. And so uh, we should view ourselves and our actions as part of the system as a whole. Uh, and part of this is looking at these more ephemeral values uh, that Taru has also mentioned here about the sense of belonging or, or how we use the sea and, and, and so. Um, and as the first region in the world, the Baltic has now tried to do this um, through a form of assessment where we're, we've um, looked at the countries and people around the Baltic and seen what does it cost us um, when the sea is not in a good state. So both monetary values, uh, for example, we have here, in, in my view, uh, this here, uh, <laughs> represents eutrophication <laughs> and, and algal blooms. Um, and it's been calculated that every year, the, the fact that the sea is eutrophied causes 4 billion euros of losses every year to this region. And then you have to compare that, like that's a loss that we could compensate by doing better work on land <laughs> and linking what we do to how the, ecosystem, the state of the ecosystem. But we also looked at, at uh, for example, how people value the marine environment by asking for what we, what we call the willingness to pay. So how much would an individual citizen be willing to pay in order to have the sea in a better state? And uh, this being the first time this has ever been done, the assumption was that it wouldn't be very much, but actually, irrespective of which country uh, you are looking at, the willingness to pay is very high. So there is this part of us that recognizes that we are part of the system, the system has value, uh, that the state of the sea in itself has intrinsic value, that it's not just how we use it, like for shipping or fishing or, or even recreational value, but that it has an intrinsic value in itself. And I think this is uh, when you asked what main thing could we do to improve the state of the sea. It is this like regime, regime shift in thinking. That's it. That's where we have to start. That's the starting point because in, in the end, governance uh, and, and like law, all of these, they're good tools, but by themselves, tools don't build a house. Like, it doesn't matter if you have a saw, a hammer, and nails. If you do nothing with them, nothing will happen. And it's the same here. These are all tools, but we have to use them, and we can only use them if we learn how. And we can only learn how if we see what our role is um, in the system as a whole. So I think that's, uh, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> to answer this very broad question. And a, a short comment also on, um, we were talking about management um, and in, in the ecosystem approach, so with the view that we are part of the ecosystem, we are not above it, we don't stand outside it. Uh, there's something called ecosystem management, which is uh, used, for example, in marine spatial planning, uh, where the idea is that when we do manage, it is ourselves that we manage. We do not try to manage the, the sea or the species or how it functions, but we manage our own actions so that the sea has more space. Tying back to where I started this. Thank you. <laughs> Nina, you had something as well. Uh, yes. Intriguing, I think, the value studies and so, but there is one problem uh, when you study values. People say something, but in practice they don't necessarily pay. Uh, anything extra, because it's quite like, like the, it's tied to their practices, everyday practices are what kind of livelihoods they have and, and things like that. So in a way it needs to be enabled also that you can practice your values in, in your everyday life. And, but there are of course a lot of, in, if we think that would be the business as usual, just mm, they would uh, continue barbecuing the beef there and, and so on, and, and throwing plastic and litter into the sea, uh, but they could start instead uh, barbecuing vegetables and or eating more or less meat, and, and then it would 
force the farmer to uh, do something else. Not 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 in a way that it would he would lose his his uh, earn or livelihood, but um, in a more sustainable way. So that would be, of course, an ideal uh, case. And there are, like you said, like mar maritime spatial planning and different kind of tools to start pushing for that. But as you said, it need, we need everybody needs to think, rethink how, the way how 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 one acts. Yeah, very true. Um, Henrik, did you also? I think you, you also mentioned the, the term business as usual, and of course, if we think of of the oceans as a whole, business of usual is, is in a way the, the, the road to disaster. It, yeah. it, I mean, we are thinking of, of, of uh, biodiversity loss and, and, and climate change and, and all the parameters that we see now. Mm -hmm. So, so the, 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 the starting point, of course, is that business as usual is not an acceptable scenario. Um, the situation is in, in the Baltic Sea is, is, is the same, but in addition, we have this additional problem, which is not necessarily very prevalent in, in, in the world's ocean, and that is the, the eutrophication, which most people associate with the, with the environmental concerns of, of the Baltic Sea. But as opposed to most other ocean problems, we know exactly what we need to do to reduce eutrophication. And I think that is not fully being really transformed into action, that, that knowledge, because, because we, we know what causes. And, and of course we have done a lot and we can already see some improvements, but, but there are still many, many, many things that we know that would, would help the situation that, that could and, and should be taken. I had something else, but I, I, I forgot. I was thinking, yeah, Taro, yeah, good. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that, that it's, uh, um, I think the kind of perception um, is really interesting to think of how people perceive the environment and how the ch massive change in, in the perception of the Baltic Sea and the, the awareness of the problem has been, you know, just in the last 10, 20 years has changed dramatically and how everybody has uh, awareness through media a lot, you know, but also just through a lot of work. Um, so there's a kind of the knowledge and that awareness and that also that personal sense of relation to the problem is already there. But the kind of that one shift of how do we practice that? How do we shift the kind of there's a sort of system change that is needed somehow? And I was thinking of that in relation to the global oceans and the uh, it's not just the Baltic Sea that is dying. You know, there's, there's the the vast there's still a lot of this um, thinking that these oceans are so huge that we can't possibly affect them. But there's already a constant extinction going on because of, of overfishing, for example, and now the acidification, etc., from climate change. So how that kind of, um, I was just thinking of how this kind of level of awareness that we have about the Baltic Sea and the issues with the Baltic Sea, how could that be somehow, you know, um, expanded? to the global oceans and, and what is needed in that process in, in making kind of, because that is the first step when you actually understand that there's an issue and you're somehow involved in that. Um, and I think the practical, uh, the practice question of how do we start practicing, how do we change our everyday practices? I was thinking of the Helcom uh, established here, this little uh, turtle reserve. <laughs> And, uh, and so I added this little turtle that had already kind of started swimming outside of the reserve. And, and there's a lot of obviously already proof of how maritime uh, reserves, nature protection areas are actually benefiting the local fishermen, uh, fishing communities and so on. So there's a lot of resistance first because there's the fear that now that there's a conserving area, conserved area, we can't fish there anymore, but actually very quickly the ecosystems have uh, have kind of picked up, and, and 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 they've really benefited the local communities. But the, these sorts of stories, we need to also hear and understand these stories, and not just the problems, in order to actually understand how the the work, these efforts, can really have a, a really massively beneficial effect also for local human communities. Yeah, uh, I just quickly want to come back to, to something um, that you said about that the Baltic can function as a, as a kind of example for the global oceans. And this is in fact a, a very valid point because uh, the Baltic functions as a, as a kind of miniature laboratory of what we can expect 
in the future for larger water bodies, such as the oceans. Uh, and especially for questions uh, regarding climate change, where we know that this region, like we have changes happening much faster than we have elsewhere, but the same changes are coming everywhere. Uh, what we also have here, um, which is a positive thing compared to a lot of places around the world, uh, is it might be that we have one of the most polluted seas in the world, but we also have the best governed sea in the world. So the rest, the rest of the world can use the Baltic as an example of what can be achieved if you just have the will and the possibility to do it. And I think this is somewhere something that we would need to actually use more in the Baltic as a region. Um, and also, I want to point out that I think uh, we have twice comment now about the Baltic is dying and <laughs> it's essentially over, but I don't think that's true. Like, I think we are already seeing some signs of improvement because what we are doing is having an effect. It's just our perception of how fast things should happen is completely not in line with how nature works. Like we make, uh, we limit the number of, or no amount of fertilizers we put on the fields and two years later, we have the questions like, why, why aren't we seeing change? But it doesn't work like that. We have to wait at least say 50 years for this, but 50 years for the environment isn't that much. Can I just add, add to just a, a thing related to, to that? A question which is also very relevant is, is what, what is it that we are seeking to achieve? Because is there such a thing as a pristine ecosystem? Was there ever a pristine state of the Baltic Sea? And is it, I would say no, ecosystems are changing all the time and, and, and that's, that's, that's how they operate. And it's, it's not realistic to believe that we could somehow come back to an ecosystem that our grandfathers used to know. But we, we, we need to try to make sure that we have a functioning ecosystem that is in balance, that, that is, is, is not constantly being pressurized by us. And that, I think, is, is, is a different goal than going back to, to a, so this pristine thing which, which may not even exist. you're saying is exactly what the e ecosystem approach is about because we can't go back to something that's pristine because we are part of the ecosystem so our actions they are so to say allowed to have effect the question is how much effect and on what and are they having so much effect that it actually is negatively impacting the system as a whole and by extension ourselves um, we're talking about at the the the, the rate of, of of change and how how we that nature has another pace than, than we have uh, in many times. Um, but so, is it okay? Can we, can we interfere with that? Uh, I mean, that's what we, especially regarding the Baltic Sea, um, been thinking about this bioengineering or geoengineering, uh, in, in our case regarding the sea, um, activities where we go in and, and try to, to wrap wrap up the, the pace of, of change, for example, um, uh, trying to do something to, towards the uh, lack of oxygen in the Baltic Sea by, by bubbling it in, uh, more, more uh, oxygen into to a system. Um, are these okay? Also, how, how, can we do, how can we deal with these things, with, uh, Magnus or, or uh, yeah, Henrik? Well, thank you. Well, uh, from a legal point of view, these uh, these things are super interesting because because th th they are, are are not regulated at all. Uh, but 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 I think more generally speaking, this this is a, a very good example of our impatience. I think with with and our desire to to invent quick fixes to fix problems that really bother us. Um, and and I, I think the the, the the situation we are in now, there are various technologies being promoted to, to, to improve the, the oxygen level in, at the seabed, uh, I mean, to prevent that this phosphorus is, is, is being released. Mm. 
I think both from a legal point of view, but also more generally, the problem is we don't, we don't know if these work or not. And bef even small scale experiments have, have been not always entirely clear on, on whether they work or not. But of course, it's a completely different ballgame to move from a little sheltered bay somewhere or, or Littoist and Järvi to, to the Baltic Sea as a whole and I imagine that the same type of, of, of treatment would, would, would work. So, so I think, it, no, I, I think we should, we should not discard them either because, because but, but, but I think one should slow down uh, the engineers wishing to go proceed too, too fast because what we really need to know is, is, is have more knowledge about are they, are they beneficial or not. And for that purpose, you could allow them uh, for research purposes. Mm -hmm. And that is a completely different thing than large scale sort of industrial. So, so I, I would very much promote uh, small scale experiment to learn more about this. And, and some technologies might work fine. And, 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 and well, we don't know about the risks even. No, true. Taru. One of the really sort of startling things for having worked with scientists that I think me and the artists coming in, we think that scientists know so much, they know everything. And, and then they basically tell us that they, they know a lot of the limits of their knowledge. <laughs> you know, they're constantly discovering more of what they don't know. And, and especially when we're talking about the sea, uh, the sea is so little now, like they say that Mars is more studied than the bottom of the sea. Uh, so how can we start having, uh, you know, making big interventions into an environment, an ecosystem that we don't actually know very much about at all? So I think my technological intervention would be in a very sort of small scale, send the kind of, let the scientists send these guys down there to study what's there before we blow it all up. Um, would Magnus or Nina have anything to, to comment on that? I'm thinking about the technology and, and the business world as well, and, and um, y you know, how, how do we include the maritime business um, and get this type of thinking into, into a more sustainable um, business? Um, yeah. Maybe maybe I would like to make three points in a way. Uh, that uh, w one thing is is that I, I believe a lot of things are are done already. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, basically through the mechanisms that that companies care about their reputation, and as we learn that they do certain bad things, they w don't want to do these bad things. So, so and, and there are very good examples from from uh, Finnish industry where where they, for example, promote even stricter uh, pollution. Uh, you know restrictions than than uh, the, the the regulation would 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 you know command them to do. Um, uh, another thing I, I think uh, because again companies works a bit you know they you give them a carrot and they run after it so so um, there has been a lot of talk about for example how how we restructure and rebuild our world post COVID if that time is ever coming but but anyway we we need to to start doing something and and. And on the, on the, for example, public side, we, we do a lot of purchases all the time. And there we really have a, an opportunity in a way to, to show that we, we can pay for what, put the money where, where our mouth is in a way. Uh, and I, I think that will have a tremendous effect if, if, we, if that's used correctly. But it's also, we, we need to be aware that it, it will be expensive. Um, and the, the, probably I think the, the third thing is, is one of my maybe favorite topics and, and nicely connects to the idea of a living lab. and, and um, and, and also relates to, to, to one, one, one old a colleague of mine who, who concluded her PhD thesis that, that the only way we can understand each other is to meet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of to, to meet, for example, around a table like this or and together with, with business people, lawyers, uh, art, art, arts people and so on. That then we can maybe understand what kind of sea we want to uh, be living in. Thank you, Magnus. One thing uh, regarding the geoengineering, geoengine uh, first, I, as far as I have understood, uh, these solutions are at best quite local and small scale. And second, if we don't know, this is the governance point, if we don't exactly know what are the consequences and effects, then we should follow the precautionary principle. And maybe that's also our 
a good point, or just came to my mind, that when we have this living lab, so we should also follow the precautionary principle also. We can be imaginative, but we also maybe need to be careful and, and think carefully what we can and what, what we could and what we can't do. Um, we can maybe move into the, the final activity of, of um, uh, the living lab um, activities, evaluate um, the topics we discussed here, and, and, and Magnus was uh, talking about that already, to evaluate um, how we, this, this type of, of working together and, and as a living lab or something else, and how we meet. Uh, what is your thoughts, Taro, on, on this? Um, what works, um, and, and what's, how do you see it? To, to bring these different disciplines, different sectors, different uh, actors uh, together. Is this a, a good way to go? And um, I think this is definitely kind of um, good to have something to gather around. From my experience of working with art projects where we've invited a lot of different researchers from different fields around a table in a seminar room, uh, we usually get stuck with the first word like nature or ecology and nobody can agree you know, on, the, on the kind of definition and what we're talking about. Uh, but if you take people to the island of Sailly, for example, and you gather around uh, something there very concretely in the environment um, and, and a kind of shared concern, then that's kind of, we can cross over those sort of disciplinary and language uh, differences somehow. And, um, and so I think that's kind of somehow, I think always this gathering should ideally also happen in these environments and places that we're actually talking about and engaging with because it becomes uh, a lot more. Uh, this kind of, in a way, the place itself can take part in the conversation somehow and the ecosystem is sort of much more, has a voice maybe in a different way than, than the disciplines. So, um, so actually thinking about what I said before, I think I would definitely send artists down there as well, you know, with their little tools. Uh, but both artists and scientists should also oh, become very, very aware of the consequences of, of sort of the actions. And so I think that kind of there's a real need to also think together of our own methodologies and, and practices and, and the traditions of knowledge and maybe the limitations to those of what we can know and how. And, uh, and so they're kind of, um, so this is also, it's a very slow process and, and humbling process where you have to kind of accept that, you know, yeah, maybe you were kind of bit, you know, you know, wrong about something. And, and, and so there's a kind of, you need a kind of a safe space for that too, where yeah. people feel that they can really critically self-reflect, you know, on their own practices as well. But also take time to kind of really um, uh, value those different approaches and, and to kind of get excited about the unknown and not only see that as a, as a kind of a threat uh, to your own sort of uh, knowledge or understanding. And I, I think that's where the arts are really good because the artists obviously get most excited when there's something unknown <laughs> and something that cannot be quite grasped yet, you know, so, yeah, thanks. Janika, you have, in, in your work, I think, been working quite a lot, I guess, with, um, getting people together, overcoming the language barriers that we have between disciplines and also overcoming um, barriers in thinking. Um, I know, know there's very interesting ways of that Helcom is usually engaging us researchers or others in, in discussion. So can you say, uh, reflect a little bit upon this living lab thing versus, versus what you usually work and, and do? To engage. Yeah, I think this approach here is, is, would be a really good complement to a lot of the work that we're doing. Because even though we at, in Helcom try to kind of bridge these silos of thinking and, and silos of expertise that, that people have around the Baltic, it is still really hard to visualize this. Uh, and that's where I think this is, this is a really good approach. Um, because, again, coming back to something Taro, Taro said, uh, about how we need to know the consequences of what we're doing. So, and how, how sometimes scientists are very limited in their knowledge, but at least we are aware <laughs> that we are limited. Because the, the ecosystem is, is kind of like a, like a clockwork. You have all these little gears where every gear 
affects it in the next year and the next year and the next year. And we've gotten so far in our knowledge that we know that that's how it works, which is already good. But to figure out like how they fit together. And if you do geoengineering or bioengineering and you change one gear for another, what's the consequences? Will, will the system still work? Um, and I think something like this, where you can illustrate these links like, we, we didn't have the possibility to do that so much today, partly because of time limitations and partly because of corona and you can't touch anything. <laughs> uh, but it's possible to, through a landscape like this, show how these parts link together and so use it as a, a communication tool to bridge these gaps between silos. Um, so I think the living lab approach is, is really good and it's very useful, um, but it could be extended out even further. We have, uh, we have plans and I'll talk about them a little bit later on. I think um, either starting from something like this or maybe pulling it apart or, or having people to create, put people together in different groups and create the, the environment or, and, and bring forward or then build the solutions maybe uh, to something. Maybe that would be a creative process as well. Um, yeah, we who, who've been working a little bit with this idea of a living lab, uh, Nina, Magnus, and Henrik. Maybe can you say something about this? Um, how, how, what do we, as researchers, need to do more? I mean, I think we need to extend ourselves a little bit to other disciplines, of course. But any reflections on that? Um, yeah, I think it's yet for us to, to perhaps define and. and uh um, as, as Janika said, to extend the concept and, and, and you know, give it meaning, the meaning it has for us and, and invite even more stakeholders around the table. Um, I, I think that that, that would, that's basically the idea of the whole living lab that, that we can together, you know, sit here and, and, and figure out how, how we want the technology to work for us and, and what value we put into the ecosystem services that the sea can, that can provide us. But, but it, it does obviously doesn't work if we only uh, have se selected actors around. Uh, but we, we need to enlarge. But we are, um, you know, we are starting up, so I, I'm, I'm quite confident that um, this will be something good. And, and um, but it takes a lot of time, and it needs to be a continuous process. We've been working together for two years now, at least um, three of us. And only now, maybe, enabled to or capable of understanding at least a small share of what, for example, you and your research is all about. So it really takes time, and you need to be in constant dialogue and, in co and constantly doing something together. That is maybe a more general note on, on interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. But but I think the living lab concept is. It is exactly about that, but it, it is maybe a more tangible way of, of elaborating and developing this multidisciplinary thinking. But um, some additional thoughts. First, first of all, on, on interdisciplinary cooperation, it's of course very frustrating <laughs> uh, for a, for a, for a long time, but then. Finally, when you manage to bridge even a small gap, it, 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 it's in, incredibly rewarding. But 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 it it it, it is so draining uh, the, the the process. So I, I would never advise anybody to only do interdisciplinary research. Do do your own research very tightly as well. Um, but then secondly, I think on on, on the, the the living lab thing, I think the interesting things happen when you discuss very small details. Because if you have a very broad group of participants and a very broad theme, you will normally end up just with very broad. Uh, but when you start looking at one, take a, a turtle here, and then we start to discuss the turtle, that's really where, where, where things start happening. So, so that is another thing to, to, to bear in mind when enlarging it, that we should also keep it detailed enough to be interesting and, and, and make those bridges. Sure. We can open up now as well uh, for for the audience. If, if if you have any comments or reflections, you can write it in the in the Zoom chat or or if, if someone has a something to add here. Yeah. Let's see if I can. I 
just wanted to add one, one point of view. Uh, we also have to remember that um, Baltic Sea has been there much longer than we. It's almost, let's say, 12,000 years old, and it, it has always been uh, on a changing. There's always been a process. First, it was a small, not small, but a Baltic ice lake. And uh, when it was developing, it has also developed our cultures. We wouldn't be here without uh, Baltic Sea. And uh, so we have to kind of respect its past also, and we have to respect how we are using it. Uh, now we are mostly talking here about how we use it, but we also have to think what it has given to us. Yeah, just a small comment about the history. Yeah, that's it. Um, any more comments or reflections? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, inspiring uh, talks and presentations and uh, um, there were many good points and, and I also enjoyed the discussion about the multidisciplinarity because that is something that it really takes time and it takes effort but it's worthwhile and all those insights into that I hope, I hope this gets recorded and spread out <laughs> all over where people are trying to um, create dialogues with different fields which is really, really important, I think. Um, I just have a small uh, question um, concerning that. Uh, when having dialogues um, crossing fields and disciplines, it's also um, important to find uh, uh, concepts in common. And there was like one concept, uh, I think I, at least Jannika used it, maybe someone else too. And I would just like to ask about the um, ecosystem services, is that, uh, a concept that you all use and do you find it useful and because it's something it's a concept that pops up every, every it's in school books even for 14 years <laughs> uh, for students from 14 years old and um, and it comes up like in, in various places that is it, is it a concept that you find useful yes thank you uh, I would say that Yes, it's useful, but for a long time it's been very limited, like both the understanding and there's, as we talked about somewhere here as well, that you can sit down around a table and have a word and nobody can agree on what it means. This fell into that category for a long time, where uh, depending on what your background was, ecosystem services had completely different meanings to different uh, groups of experts. Uh, I think slowly, it's, as uh, was also mentioned, a long process, but slowly we are getting there. There is get a, We have more consensus. And there's also understanding that you need to open it up. It's not just the precise service that the ecosystem provides to us. Uh, it's, it's bigger than that. Ecosystem services is not providing pollinators or giving us fresh water or oxygen to breathe, even though all of these are very important things. It's how all of these are interlinked. And as we talked about, and we had a comment from the audience, also what we can give back. Like we are part of it too. What's our role? What service do we provide? Um, and I think, especially now at 2020, which is a turning point uh, for a lot of global agreements, um, and we have a, an upcoming Convention on Biological Diversity new set of targets, for example, where ecosystem service is really a central uh, aspect of those that I think it's going to become increasingly important uh, and increasingly more frequently used as we start to experience the effects of climate change more directly and also as we understand that it's something that needs to be tackled globally and can't be dealt with in individual regions one at a time. Um, yeah, I, I have been trying to avoid the, the concept of ecosystem services because it has um, traditionally, it, it has been very human centric in a way that the ecosystem nature is providing some different services to us humans. But now the concept has been maybe opening up so that if we, if we if we take it that also human being is part of the ecosystem, then the services are both directions that also we provide some services to 
to to nature but i still i try to avoid it but it's difficult because it is a baseline in many many policies and declarations um so that's but uh generally about the concepts i think we have been discussing about the concept of ecosystem for quite some time in our group because for business people they talk about business ecosystems and and biologists talk about ecosystems in their own way uh, so that there that's that's very crucial to, uh, to to in in multidisciplinary work to define the concepts and, and understand that the other discipline can use it uh, mean totally different thing when using the same concept another question or comment here thank you I was during the lunch time in uh, near the river for uh, lunch and I had also time to go to library and it was quite amazing that there were many new books then the title was uh, something about water or sea or, or so and then I opened one new book and there was a poem I think it's uh, very good in this situation but I read it in Finnish because uh, because it is in Finnish. <laughs> Eihän joetkaan syntyneet sähköä takomaan tai vapaat sydämet ja vahvat hevoset vain taakkaa kantamaan. Matti Johannes Koivu. And I think this is so important to find this balance that uh, we have great, great problems, but how refreshing our river and our archipelago and photos are. So, so we shall take care, that will we do, yes, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the presentations, it was very, very interesting, thank you. Thank you so much, and I think, um, I think that sums up uh, a lot that we discussed here today, and, and I think we, can, we, we should start summing up here as well, and um, I've been thinking about um, the, the good an, an interesting part of Abagora this year has really been uh, about, um, or at least enlightened me on, on these many other aspects than, than these services that we can, can be used as, as very sort of strict, categorical, very mechanical, very technical, uh, but that can probably help us uh, to understand some parts, but, but about the heritage or the, the, the bringing in the, the cultural understanding that we have discussed about uh, the pre-symposium was about um, visiting Saley and, and, and f sort of engaging with the space there and, and understanding, as we've talked about here as well, uh, these small details that can connect, connect us um, to try to find these um, solutions to these problems. Um, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can use this uh, maritime uh, legal landscape that we have here, that we call Legal Mar or the Legal Mar Table project, that um, we will, we will um, actually um, start using this more in our education as well and, and also bring it to the schools and even to the hopefully a high up uh, politicians and other uh, administrators that, that can make, a, that make uh, the decisions on a really high international level. Um, uh, so there's much that we can we can still do with this I hope and, and in the end I think we shall, um, we're going to um, donate this uh, to, to a school whether it's here in Finland or somewhere else, uh, that is still, that is still um, up. But I want to thank all of you uh, in this panel, it's our discussion, Living Lab, it's uh, been very insightful, I think, um, and, and also to all of you that's been here today um, and, and on, on the internet, if it's anything, you can also feel free to come back to us and, and discuss this. And I wanna sort of end with, with the positive note of uh, first going, sort of looking forward that things can really change and, and this is discussed on a very, very high level in the world. Um, and if Nina can uh, show us the secret of this table uh, the, today and, and as an enlightenment to uh, our future discussions with an enlight the little lighthouse that we have there, I will um, have a quote. Uh, from John Knox um, from uh, the United Nations. Biodiversity is really necessary for the enjoyment of rights to food, water, health, 
the right to live a full and happy life. Without the services that healthy ecosystems provide across the board, we really can't enjoy a whole range of human rights, and healthy ecosystems really depend on biodiversity in us. Thank you. Thank you.